Welcome to Swiss Re Institute Spotlight a series of thought provoking webinars and events produced by Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. Today's webinar, the second in our series, puts uh, the spotlight on the manufacturing industry in Europe and how AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning can advance maintenance systems. Is it overhyped or are we at the doorstep of a next disruptive development? My name is Daniel Andres. Joining me at the Swiss Re Institute are two very distinguished expert and industry thought leaders. Good morning, everyone, online and in the web space. Let me quickly run you through our today's agenda. Professor Olga Fink from the ETH in Zurich will launch our webinar to provide an overview on what is cutting edge in the industry in terms of predictive maintenance and how smaller manufacturers can implement this new approach. The first impulse is followed by our second presenter, André Kroyol, from our Swiss Free Corporate Solutions Risk Engineering, who will explore how risk is changing when implementing AI and machine learning in maintenance systems and how insurers can help you to make progress in modern maintenance. Both our experts will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each. Then we will invite them back for a 15 to 20 minute panel discussion to address some of your questions. If you would like to post the questions, please use the respective questions fields on the left side of your screen in front of you. Just send in your questions at any point in time. Instead of a traditional Q&A after each presentation, we will save all your questions for the panel discussion. Now let's hear from Olga how pioneering companies are driving modern maintenance systems and how you can as well become part of this change. Olga Fink is a Swiss National Science Foundation Professor for Intelligence Maintenance Systems at the ETH in Zurich. Her extensive research as the Chair of Intelligence Maintenance systems at ETH is uniquely positioned to explain how the future of maintenance looks like and how companies can implement state-of-the-art maintenance technologies. Please, Olga, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I'm very excited to share some of my research um, today with you, um, and also I'm um, excited to discuss um, further on with you. So my research focuses on how to bring intelligence, and particularly artificial intelligence, um, into maintenance systems, and this is also the focus of the talk today. So we live in an exciting world, um, yeah, particularly in an exciting time, and there's a lot of um, things that artificial intelligence um, can actually do today that was not possible ye um, yesterday or some time ago. And one of the particular tasks that artificial intelligence is able doing today is, um, for example, recognizing objects, and they're really good in that. And artificial intelligence algorithm are actually learning from examples. So to learn from examples, we need a lot of data, and particularly or in ideal case, um, they need data um, that is labeled so that all, the, um, all what is there to learn is provided to the algorithms. Um, so this is for the recognizing objects. Um, and um, one particular task of recognizing objects is spotting cancer in tissue slides. And this is also where artificial intelligence is achieving remarkable results and is even overachieving the results um, that were produced by experts. And artificial intelligence is also able to hold interviews at press conferences. It's able to teach itself how to code. It's also becoming creative in writing film scripts. Um, and also, um, it started painting paintings um, that are sold at auctions at Christie's and are really achieving remarkable um, sums um, that, that were generated there. But if you look into what artificial intelligence was, um, is actually really capable of doing, and all of the tasks that, we, um, that I just listed, um, they are really narrowly defined, and they're really specifically defined for one task, and an algorithm that is defined for that task, if applied to something else, it will fail. Um, and so the next step uh, from, the artificial from the artificial narrow intelligence that is defined by this task um, is the artificial general intelligence. And then the next step uh, would be the super, the artificial superintelligence. However, we are really not there yet. Um, so we are really, most of the, of the algorithms that are available today are focusing on this very dedicated narrow intelligence task. Oh. 
And if you look into the fields um, where artificial intelligence and deep learning was thriving in, in the last years, and it's particularly computer vision, but it's also natural language processing and it's speech recognition. And the question is, um, what is actually hindering predictive maintenance so far from benefiting from the remarkable results that we achieved um, in other fields? Um, and this is um, what I um, would like to develop a bit with you. So if you remember when I was introducing uh, what, how artificial intelligent algorithm actually learning, so they are learning from examples. And the examples needs to, need to be representative and they need to be lots of them. So if you look into the task that predictive maintenance is solving, um, well, um, we're actually trying to predict um, faults that are really uh, rarely happening. And, and luckily they're rarely happening because the systems that we are monitoring are highly reliable. And particularly for safety critical systems, Systems. Um, this, this would be um, a no-go if, if we are having a lot of them. Um, well, th this is unfortunate for us um, because we cannot learn from them. Um, so is there a way around it um, how we can still learn something without having a lot of examples to learn from? Um, so luckily what we have a lot um, of data for is actually the healthy system condition. Um, so why not um, taking this healthy system condition and train our algorithm to learn the, the representation of it um, on the first step um, to learn um, representative features that are enabling us then to, um, to extract a health indicator based um, from this and then measuring everything else that is now coming as a distance to what we learned on the, uh, from the cell Safe, um, from the healthy system conditions. And then interpreting this as a health indicator. So basically, um, the dis when the distance starts deviating from the healthy condition that we trained our algorithm on, we can then um, assume um, that this now the probability is increasing, that we're now seeing something that would be abnormal or faulty system condition. And as one example of this, um, it is a case study of a generator that was applied um, in a nuclear power plant. And this is not an environment we would like to see a lot of faults. Uh, it was a case study that we conducted to, um, together with General Electric, and we had um, there was a um, highly sophisticated condition monitoring system um, applied to it. Um, there was about 300 um, sensors that were applied, um, and uh, we had data every five minutes. Um, so these were snapshots, and the observation period was about uh, um, one year. And we knew that some at some point of a time something was happening, and the task was uh, so when is the first point in time? that we will be able to, to detect it. And obviously, uh, we only had healthy data that we could learn from. So this is also what we did. Um, we developed the algorithm um, and trained it just based on the healthy condition, and then we started monitoring. So the orange part is when we really started um, or put it in place and started monitoring it. And after a while, at around day 160, we saw, well, the, there was some development that um, is now starting to be abnormal. And the other case that we saw that um, there were e even two jumps in the, in the data, in the health indicator, um, and the second um, time was uh, that is around um, the day 250. This was also the point in time when the sophisticated condition monitoring system was um, uh, was detecting it, um, and the algorithm that we developed um, was actually detecting it around 100 days before. Um, well, so uh, basing or, or developing algorithm based on just healthy system condition um, seems to work, and um, this is also could be a way around, particularly for safety critical systems. Um, so now we are able to detect faults, um, but what we would also like to do is also to distinguish which fault types are really happening. Um, however, for this, the typical um, task would be um, solving this as a classification task, but in many systems, um, we would not even know which fault types would be occurring. And again, we don't have sufficient um, samples to learn from. So is there still a way how we can support our maintenance engineers and tell them what they need to do, not just that they need to do something? Um, so if you remember what we were actually doing when we were learning the features, we were reconstructing the input that was provided to the algorithm. So basically what the algorithm train, was trained to do uh, was to, to learn the representation of the health system condition. So once we had detected something and we present this faulty data to the algorithm, it will still reconstruct it to the healthy system condition. And what we will observe afterwards is that there is a deviation between the reconstructed signals and the 
there are faulty signals that are actually monitored. And we will see that the deviation will be the highest in the signals that were affecting it and that were actually the root cause of the fault. So again, we did it um, for this generator case study. We detected it and then we went back and from the 320 sensors that we had, we could narrow it down to just a couple of them. Um, and when presented to the expert, the expert could um, just looking at the one of the signals could tell what the fault type really was. Um, and this is an integrated approach, so we are not putting in some additional algorithm um, and it comes with no additional cost because it already was trained to do so. Um, so this is how we can distinguish between the different fault types. So also this can be solved and we can distinguish between the fault types um, and, and can really um, tell what the root cause of the fault um, would actually be. However, what we're really highly relying on is on the, on, on the um, fact that the system conditions that we are using for training are really representative and that they are really covering all the operating conditions that we are expecting to observe afterwards. Um, well, this, this cannot always be the case because we, we probably need to wait for quite a while. Um, so in the case of, uh, of gas turbines, um, so the first part that you see here in, um, in red and green, this was the part that um, we used for one month and we trained the algorithm and then we put it into operation. Um, and obviously when we started monitoring it, um, well then immediately afterwards um, it was um, detecting something um, uh, which, which was um, not supposed to be detected. Detected. And then we saw, well, it has actually not yet seen winter condition, um, and that's um, normal that we did not, um, um, that it was detecting it. So if we extend the observation period to about nine months, um, well, then we also start, start detecting things when they are supposed to be detected. Um, but the question is, how long do we really need to wait until we're sure that the data set is representative? Is it nine months? Is it one year? Is it two years? And when are we really sure that we covered all the operating conditions? And is there a solution um, around it? Um. Well, luckily, um, there, there is not just one system, but um, typically we will have also a fleet of systems. Um, so it's not just um, one gas turbine that is operated, but several gas turbines under different conditions. And why not using the fleet experience and transfer this fleet experience uh, between the um, units um, that are composing this fleet? And on the one hand, we would like to learn from the healthy conditions. And on the other hand, we would also like um, to transfer the knowledge um, on the faulty condition if something is happening. Happening. Well, this works quite well if we have very similar operating conditions and very similar units. However, this is not happening if we have dissimilar operating conditions, um, and this happens quite a lot um, in reality. Um, so the challenge here is not just to use um, the, the units of a fleet that are too similar, otherwise we are not learning anything, um, but also not to, me, um, not to use, um, not to combine units of a fleet that are too different, because otherwise we will not be detecting anything. Um, and if you remember what we were actually doing uh, with this um, health uh, monitoring um, or the one class classifier, uh, we were actually measuring the distance of what is appearing now to what we have um, trained the algorithm on. Um, and why not doing the very same and training it um, on the unit A um, and then um, putting the data from unit B um, and uh, monitoring, uh, will it be recognized by this algorithm as healthy or not and, and having a balance um, between learning something additional. Uh, and if this is the case, if we com can combine these healthy conditions from two units, uh, well, then we can benefit from the um, of the two units um, and combine the operation experience and by that, in reach also the operating conditions from both units and transfer between them. So again, this is what we did um, for, for a gas turbine fleet that was composed of around um, 112 units. Um, and um, on the, well, what you see now is um, when we trained the algorithm just on one month of data, obviously it was, it was detecting everything as unhealthy, but the unit was actually healthy. Um, and when we enriched it with the operation experience from similar units that are operated similarly, well, then we, we also were not detecting anything um, on the healthy system condition. Um, and on the contrary, in a unit where we have observed a fault, again, if we trained in a very short period of time, it was detecting something right away when we started monitoring. But on the other hand, when we extended the operation experience from other units of the fleet, then we also started detecting things when, when we we're also supposed to be detecting something. 
So also this um, um, is an issue that can be solved and there are different approaches to that. And this was just a snapshot of um, challenges that we are working on. Um, however, there is also more to come and more to go. Um, and if you look into what needs to be done in order to make it really transferable. So we need um, or, or we are working on uh, making it more scalable and uh, making the system self-adaptable to new operating conditions. But also we are working on how to automate um, the development of these approaches and not to, um, to, to, to handcraft each of the models separately. Um, and what we need also to make sure in all these developments and automation is that the algorithm that um, we are developing uh, remain robust and remain um, also reliable. Um, and on the other hand, what we need to make sure is to enable the engineers who are using this system still to be able to interpret um, the results that are occurring and not just providing them a, um, a black box um, with just the result yes or no. And so to, to support them with the decision in the decision making process. Um, and with this, I would um, like to close my short presentation and I'm looking forward um, to um, discuss with you and um, to your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for uh, this um, brilliant overview of um, actually how this uh, works and even how it can be uh, implemented. Um, you also uh, commented um, a little bit on the, on, on the challenges and uh, I, I think there are a lot of them still to be resolved and please, if you have um, questions or if you see challenges, uh, do not hesitate to, uh, to drop them in, in, in the question box. So we are keen to look forward to um, how, you th how you see that, what, what the challenges are that, that you see. Now from that, I would like to hand over to um, our second speaker on the coil. As mentioned, he's a senior risk engineer at Swiss Re Corporate Solutions for the manufacturing and heavy industry segments. He is responsible for risk assessments and risk engineering services. Prior to joining Swiss Re, he worked as brilliant factory leader for GE Power, implementing industry 4.0 practice in GE's global supply chain. André, floor is yours. I'm looking forward to. Many thanks, Daniel. Many thanks, Olga. Thanks a lot for the very interesting research feedback on artificial intelligence in predictive maintenance. From me, you will now be hearing about predictive maintenance from the risk engineering perspective based on the off-the-shelf systems. What's today available in the market, like from Schneider Electric, from GE, from Uptake and the like. So there won't be much artificial intelligence in there yet, because most of them are rather based on sensor data drawn predictions with intelligent trend monitoring and maybe some minor pattern recognition. To, do, uh, to shed some light in, I give you a feedback of the industry status, obviously uh, the insurer's perspective and then Swiss Re corporate solutions, risk transfer solutions that can support it. I'm starting with Jess Grenwood's um, uh, statement about data is the new oil. It's only useful when refined. Now, IBM is stating that today only 1% of the data generated in industry is refined, i.e. analyzed, which means there's a lot of fuel, there's a lot of raw oil out there to be used. So industry 4.0, predictive maintenance, all just overhyped. Is this really a for, uh, the fourth industrial revolution? Or is this a disillusion, disillusion phase? Now, some Industry success stories point in different direction. From my personal example, from previous career, I've been working with a plant that really had digital in their DNA, and they were early adopters of predictive maintenance. Achieving downtime reductions by 50% in, uh, in this particular manufacturing plant, and in, an increase in quality relative to less poor quality IE rejects. But that's the hard facts. The soft benefits that they were achieving went pretty much the way Olga told us before, or showed us in respect to trend monitoring, where experts were asked what, uh, if the algorithms trend 
indications were actually matching their knowledge. And here the machine tool operators were given back full transparency of their machine tool. At their fingertips with the tablets they were able to see and monitor all curves, all sensing data. Understanding at what point in time they had to reduce force in order to pre prevent shatter marks on the last or final passes of a CNC milling piece. This been the soft benefits giving back to the operators. Unfortunately, those nobody can see in the success stories. But let's look at, look at what the rest of the industry is doing. PricewaterhouseCooper, together with my innovation, established a survey with 280 industry companies concerned with manufacturing in Germany, Belgium and Netherlands. They asked the maintenance responsibles about the future plans for predictive maintenance. A stunning 25%, i.e. Every, uh, every fourth within the peer group is working with predictive maintenance already. Unfortunately, 40% do not yet. And others are looking at working with it. Maybe they want to do it next year, maybe, uh, maybe later. Same survey, just a year earlier. Over 50% had no f future plans for predictive maintenance, while every fifth out of this peer group was already working with it. The industry is doing something, but it appears to be slow. Not so slow, but it appears to be slow. So industry 4.0, the industrial revolution seems to happen. But why is it so slow? Well, it comes as part of an operations process transformation. It's not just purchasing a predictive maintenance software. It, is supposed to, uh, it has to integrate with the manufacturing and the execution system, and obviously that has to integrate with the enterprise resource planning system, i.e. operation technology needs to integrate with all information technology throughout the whole plant. That requires connecting all machines, new machines, and adding sensors to old machines. Maybe even integrating manual processes, otherwise in the indicative benefits listed here will not be achieved. Obviously, the benefits uh, listed here all de depend on whether it's an automated process or how lean optimized the process was previous to operation, the operations process transformation. Coming back to the aforementioned plant, they had previously been producing high volume, low margin milling parts. After their transformation, they've been able to attract other parts within the global supply chain competing against low-cost country plants for, uh, uh, for repair parts, low volume, high margin, but requiring high flexibility relative to the fact that the individual part may need other repairs. This is what I, what I uh, put out as a new business model. This is a total success story. Looking at the risk perspective, from, yes, we are an intro, the hypothesis remains, is the risk improving? I've clustered it by improved risk factors and new risk factors. Starting with the improved risk factors, it is the assumption is that machinery breakdown is reducing, based on reducing the frequency of smaller losses, which are more high frequent. So far, it's not been proven whether the large losses, less frequent, are reducing or maybe actually peaking. Picking backing, of course, on the reduced machinery breakdown of the small losses, business interruption will or should go down. As we heard from Olga already, OEM maintenance schedules are for, uh, for large capital equipment are usually not reduced. They would rather be supplemented. Of course, improving it, but it's not massively changing it. And last but not least, again, this is insurance perspective, we perceive that enterprise risk management hopefully moves from the current snapshot in time based on historic data to, in the future, live health indicators similar to shown by Olga, uh, to, uh, similar to what Olga showed us. New risk factors introduced is obviously the cyber vulnerability. There we move away from uh, the office desktops being uh, captured or hacked 
to actually manufacturing machines, large capital equipment, wind turbines, complete power stations that can be hacked and taken over by third parties. Then next to that, the data stream reliability. Now the whole plant is connected. Wi-Fi sensors, Bluetooth sensors, um, um, LAN cabling. The reliability of the data stream is very important for any, predictive, uh, for any predictions. If there is a rupture, if the streams are not fully reliable, the predictions may not uh, bring anything. Then data accuracy in relation to the sensing equipment, is it all, uh, is it all uh, calibrated and are, are we having really everything completely connected in order to have the full overview of the process. And last but not least, Olga named it interpretability. We name it prediction uncertainty. That's based on the type of data that was used and um, the quality of the data used for the prediction. Overall, from the insurer's perspective, of course, we have a conservative perspective. Summing up, the cumulative risk remains similar or almost the same. The hypothesis is still to be proven. We are very happy to invite anybody who's got the data and wants to prove this hypothesis with us to contact us. Us is Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, it's partner for non and standard risk transfer solutions. Standard, trans uh, standard solutions are usually tailored to the client's needs, where with the non-standard solutions, as we are the innovator in the business, we craft non-damaged business interruption covers, unplanned maintenance covers, which nobody else has, and, uh, and um, sketch extended warranties for, for instance, uh, plans with a now superior quality from what they had before, intending to actually give more warranties on their product as a, uni a unique selling argument in the market. Last but not least, database parametric solutions, um, which are easy explained at, at the example of an earthquake cover. An, earth, uh, an earthquake cover for a certain region with clearly set indicators to, um, to a threshold that is once shake intensity is measured and has been reached, automatically paying out, the, uh, paying out the losses. With that, I finish my presentation with the words, it grows over, not a chance. Just being held back by our ability to process all the new ideas fast enough. Many thanks for the attention. Also, I am looking very much forward to your questions. Thank you, André, for that um, actually nice bridge into uh, risk reality that uh, it is our business. Um, you provided quite a um, good view on the opportunities that there are, are around in terms of um, implementing uh, and, and business. Now, as you, you also mentioned, uh, we are also keen to listen to you, keen to um, learn how you see um, the things. So please uh, do not shy away from bringing up and posting your questions at this point in time. <laughs> so now um, to, to kick off our discussion I would like to um, bring up one point that uh, both of you have, have mentioned during the, the, the presentation. It is about uh, how widely it is, it is implemented uh, yet. You provided both uh, a certain state of the technology. Now, my, questions, uh, my question is, what actually hinders uh, companies? Why, do we need, why don't we see already more implemented? Uh, is it too costly? Is, it, uh, is the technology not uh, mature enough? I'm interested in both of your views. May I take that one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah? So, um, as shown, the operations process transformation of a mid-sized plant is not just purchasing another software. 
usually it cause, uh, there is a implementation period of some two years relative to the fact that the information technology has to most of the time be upgraded, uh, new ERP systems need to be implemented sometimes, the manufacturing execution system is actually, has actually not been there, it needs to be purchased. So two years implementation period is a long time. And of course, that's some, we look at uh, amounts in the six to seven digit range. Not everybody can do that right away, and often enough, uh, the benefit is not fully seen there. There, sometimes a bit of uh, disbelief comes into the game, and um, early adopters are already driving it, others are following, as we've seen. Olga? Yeah, I can up some of the experiences based on the discussions that we are having um, with um, industrial partners or with um, um, just with with companies. Um, so it it really depends on what you define as predictive maintenance. It also depends on how you define artificial intelligence. Because if we look, for example, for for simple machine learning algorithm that is already applied um, quite widely in in many different applications. If we go further into um, the deep learning, um, so, so this is uh, where, where some of the companies are a bit skeptical. Um, they want to see some um, some prototypes when it really works. Um, and for some of their um, project partners or for, for some of the companies, um, they, they just don't care what what is inside that makes for them the predictions as long as the predictions are reliable. Uh, so they are, they are really keen to explore new things and they are keen to um, well to, to see how this can benefit them. Um, and from my point of view, um, there, there are some examples also from small and mid-sized companies um, that have taken this as an opportunity and have developed new business models, have partnered up with, with some um, other companies that help them to develop this. Um, so so there, there is a range of, of different attitudes. Um, there is a range of um, also different technology attitudes. and um, So we will see also different developments from different companies. Mm -hmm. Do you see any thing that could accelerate this in terms of um, maybe different partners, uh, new players uh, that um, could be like a, an accelerator for, for these um, investments? Well, what we see quite a lot actually when, um, when we are talking to the companies is that nowadays everyone is developing his or her own solution. Um, they are partly developing their own platforms. They are developing the really dedicated to one specific company. Um, and, and partly, it's, um, it, at least from my point of view, it's, it's waste of money because it, um, the developments are run in parallel. Um, and um, it, it's... It would be beneficial if companies are partnering up, um, making the developments um, together and um, also benefiting um, everyone who would be partnering on that, also, also sharing the data. If you look into operators and manufacturers, um, partly um, each operator would be developing something and each manufacturer would be developing something, um, but, but partnering and developing it together, um, also sharing the data and sharing the experience um, could, could really foster this process and could maybe make it um, faster and faster implementation. So, so one of the things that I'm really propagating um, is uh, that, that um, collaborating is better than developing um, one solution. Um, so this helps particularly consulting companies, but probably not uh, th those who are benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting approach. I'm, I'm happy to, you, you mentioned that. Um, it's uh, also things that we observe that partnering up, teaming up with uh, different skill sets, different um, organizations than in the past is maybe something that is, that is new to them. Right? It's, uh, it, 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 it requires that uh, because I also believe that um, you, need to, you need to be able to um, uh, uh, develop these uh, new solutions together and most probably um, not anyone can develop that by ourselves. So we have received a number of questions already, which uh, um, I, I thank you very much. So please feel free to, to drop them in. Um, I um, would like to start with one of the questions that uh, we have received. Um, 
on the link to, to the risk environment. Um, and the question is, uh, can artificial intelligence also help to assess new risk factors? Um, which is maybe something for, uh, for, for Andre. Um, what's your view on that? For sure, artificial intelligence, enhanced algorithms can help assessing new risk factors. Coming back to what I mentioned in respect to enterprise risk management, um, move, it can augment risk management systems or risk management modules as part of an enterprise resource planning system or an MES. Um, clearly see that, um, first of all, the predictability of the algorithms, of the decision or the annotation of the algorithms needs to be fully understood. That's where uh, it's partly getting a little fuzzy unless um, it's really just indications about new risk factors, indications about how risk is changing, for instance, in a plant, in a power plant, um, as part of an enterprise. So yes, for sure, but I don't think we are there yet. I'd rather leave that to Olga to give us an indication of how long it may take to have artificial intelligence um, supporting risk factors. Well, actually, one of the um, re new, new emerging risk factors that you mentioned, Andre, was the last one is uh, um, the, the prediction accuracy or, yep. or the uncertainty in the predictions. Um, and this is something that, uh, for example, we're working on so that we are not only providing a prediction, but we are also providing the uncertainty given all the data that it was trained on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is, um, I, I would also say, part of the solution that if we are predicting anything that we are also quantifying the uncertainty. Um, but, but also there are other potential to, um, to, to employ um, artificial or machine learning algorithm to learn more from, um, f from emerging risk factors. So mm -hmm. I, I believe mm -hmm. there is some potential also to, to quantify it probably better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, but I don't, don't yet see it round the corner. So we will have to wait a little more and maybe we as Swiss, we engage there also a bit more with research. Mm. I think there's a nice uh, next question that uh, nicely ties into, into that uh, discussion. Uh, it's uh, on, on the experience side. And um, I would maybe like to ask Olga to, uh, to take up that, uh, that question in regard to how much more experience or what level of experience we do need until we really have the, the comfort level? Well, I think also the question is, uh, do, do we still need engineering experience and engineering expertise? And this is um, so, so always when you ask a data scientist and the data scientist would say, well, um, we, we just need data, give me the data and I will provide you the, the solution right away. Um, and actually, we are, we are having um, kind of a, um, an expert group or a platform on predictive maintenance. Uh, and there was once a speaker, and then he really asked um, in, in the group, um, so, so do you still believe that you need engineering expertise? And, and all of the in industry um, um, people actually responded that, yes, of course, you do need um, engineering expertise. And I really believe that it's an interplay um, bet between having the expertise from the maintenance side, from the engineering side and how the systems are operated and um, how this knowledge can be actually used. So um, in, in most of the cases, we cannot just run an algorithm. We first need to understand what, how the problem can be defined. And I think this is also part of the, of the disappointment that, that we see partly because a lot of people just believe, well, um, you know, we, we just need to plug in an algorithm and then it runs and then we have some results. Um, but for example, they will be applying quite a lot of this classification task and well then um, they cannot detect or predict the, um, the, the faults that are happening. Um, so, so I really believe it's not just uh, the algorithm that we need but it's it's working together with the experts and supporting the experts and for example the, the example that I've shown uh, where the expert just needed to see one of the sensors and the, um, one of the sensors deviating and he could tell exactly which fault type it would be and since we cannot learn from that we can also learn from the experts um, and this is also one of the developments that we are seeing um, that, that partly the the experts um, are actually um, well um, they, they are getting older and and, and they are not staying with the company that long um, and the ex 
expertise that they are having also needs to be captured somewhere. And this is also potential for the algorithm to, to support this knowledge transfer and to support how to give this knowledge that these experts are having actually to, um, to, to further generation, to automate it and to focus the, the expert knowledge more. Mm. I would like to pick up on this one. Having been responsible for getting machines connected within supply chain, I mean, taking really a step back from artificial intelligence algorithms, we're just getting, first of all, machines connected to reduce downtime, to see live whether a machine is online or not. That always required actually not just the maintenance expert, but like the shift lead or operator in order to set, first of all, the rules. When is the machine in operation? What is considered downtime? When is it that the operator has to uh, integrate the causes of the downtime? So there, in particular, the expertise of the operators uh, was the most important thing. Next to, of course, yes, plugging in the machine and uh, setting the algorithms for that. Yeah, we are, we are receiving uh, lots of questions, oh, um, so um, we'll, tr we'll try to kind of um, pick the, the most relevant uh, ones to, to the discussion, but um, if there will remain unanswered questions uh, at the end, we will um, also make sure that uh, this gets um, answered and then also um, uh, pushed back to you. Um, May I pick one? Sure, Andre. Uh, I like the one with uh, the skill set. Which new skill set do you see in the future workforce needs to possess? Um, we've had this. Uh, I mean, we've seen this previously uh, as a cultural change. There was a lot of hesitance in the plant of why do we need to connect machines? Why do we uh, need to be transparent? Why does everybody need to be able to see whether the machine is up or down or not and what our downtimes are, what our uptimes are? So uh, there was that became a cultural revolution. And at some point in time, we figured, hold on a second, we cannot continue to employ people with an old job description if we require now completely different talent. Um, therefore, I, I really like this question because it is a cultural revolution, basically, that can go two ways. Either one needs to employ people with new talent, with the right talent, or needs to educate the existing workforce, which is most of the time the easiest and best way because there the existing talent is simply getting new skills building on their knowledge of the machines, machine tools, of the processes and the likes. And with that talent, then the optimization of the processes can be done. Mm. Of course, few, few people uh, with uh, coding and analytics uh, background are required as well. That's of course given. Okay, so it does not go without efforts, right? That's, it doesn't uh, go what without I, efforts. What I take out. Um, um, so in, in terms of um, costs and, and, and resources, uh, I'm pointing to the, the next questions here, the next question here. Um, how do you see that, um, Olga? So in fact, the, from my point of view, this is also one of the reasons uh, that is currently hindering the companies um, to, to implement it broadly so that um, the, the solutions that are developed that are really tailored to one specific application, they are not that transferable. Um, so this um, transferability and, and um, the, the automation or the, the self-adaptability, this is really what is lacking right now. And, and if you're developing systems that are really just uh, for, for one specific application, it will be quite expensive um, and it re will require quite a lot of um, resources. Um, so, so this is what we are trying to work or what we are working on to, to make it really more scalable and how to transfer um, the, the models that are developed for one system to others and, and how to, um, to, to benefit from the experience from, from other systems. So, so this is um, something to come. It, we are not that here to automate it, um, but um, I'm sure it will, it will come. So this was also then um, maybe help smaller companies to, to implement that, uh, which again leads us in, 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 uh, in the next question. Is this an opportunity for, for, for smaller companies to, to, to profit and, and how can they actually fully benefit from, uh, from implementing predictive maintenance? 
Well, it's a significant opportunity for small companies in order to actually be more competitive. Um, raising uptime, decreasing downtime uh, by implementing uh, manufacturing execution systems together with predictive maintenance systems, which may be AI backed or not. There is a lot on the market. There is newcomers on the market like Uptake, but there are also the established parties like ABB with the Ability System, GE Digital with the Asset Performance Management System. So there's already a lot of knowledge that also smaller companies can acquire. It all comes at a cost. As I stated before, a mid-size plant, maybe six to seven digit range uh, in cost in two years implementation, a smaller company may be just a fraction of it. But it all depends on what kind of process is it, is it fully automated, is it already very good optimized or not. So there is a lot of possibility out there and I see in particular for small companies uh, that they can gain a competitive advantage relative to the increase in flexibility they would have in their operations process. Okay, so one uh, maybe other aspect is um um, also on the bit more technical side uh, in, in terms of the type of algorithms right, that um, are, are being um, a, a applied. Yeah, actually, the, the question contains a lot of um, questions in itself. So um, what we are taking as input is typically condition monitoring data. So it, it can be also processed data by the system. Um, so for example, for gas turbine, it will be temperature and pressure that are measured um, at different locations. This is what, what we will be taking in. But it really depends on the system and how the the health condition of the system is monitored. Um, and maybe it's it's a bit of a misunderstanding. So when I was talking about health indicator, it's the health of the system. So we, we are kind of adapting the language uh, of medicine um, and talking about how healthy is our, a condition or how healthy is the system. And, and when it starts deviating, it would be unhealthy um, conditions. Um, and no, we are not only looking into just one health indicator. It was just an example that I've shown. And it is an example when uh, for unsupervised learning where we don't have a lot of examples to learn from. And typically we are applying um, neural networks, different types of neural networks depending on the problem. Um, so, so, so just in short, and um, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, I, I could explain much longer, but we don't have that much time. But just, just a short explanation, it's neural networks, it's condition monitoring data. In know we are monitoring different types of systems and it depends on which system is monitored. Wonderful, I think that's uh, a huge, complexity um, in a nutshell condensed. Thank you very much, <laughs> Olga. Now let's come to um, our final question um, as we are actually running already short in time. Um, and I would like to pose that to, to Andre uh, in terms of insurance industry, right? What um, ultimately does it mean uh, for us? Are we being disrupted? Well, we are behind time, I know. Uh, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I think I could refer an hour about it. Um, but in a nutshell, um, as, tried to, uh, as I tried to show already as part of my presentation, right now the cumulative risk we see as remaining similar, if not same. Yes, there is also in insurance industry the fear of the digital disruption that tomorrow, relative to a lot better prediction systems, um, our business model is gone. Now, we don't see it right now, but we, like I said before, invite, uh, invite um, people or companies with data to prove the hypothesis of risk is improving with us. Um, we are working rather on new business models because uh, changes in uh, changes relating to industrial re revolution implementation are creating new business models with actually protection gaps for companies. So we rather see the opportunity than that our business model will be disrupted. Insurance industry has seen decreasing rates over many years anyway, so it seems like our business, our business model may at some point get disrupted. Uh, but right now um, we are rather working at finding the protection gaps with our clients and trying to add value to their customers. Okay, many thanks. Thank you, Andre, for, for that. Um, and well, um, that's all we have time for today. Uh, if you have 
Um, any further questions or if you still have your questions remain answered, un unanswered, you may reach out to your um, Swiss Re contacts. Uh, we also make sure that we can maybe push one of the other question to, to Olga or to, to um, link the contact. I would like to thank um, Olga and Andre very much for today's very lively participation, uh, the inputs, sharing experience and knowledge. And I'm sure you will join me in wishing them a lot of success in their uh, endeavors uh, in, in the future times. We would like to keep in touch with you. So expect a follow-up email with the recorded version of today's webinar so you can share it with your colleagues and clients. We will also include the link in the Institute's webpage where you can find more information on our forthcoming events and publications, including our next Spotlight webinar with Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. On that note, we will finish up. On behalf of Swiss Re Institutes and Corporate Solutions webinar team, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you and have a great day.